presence of God, and it's a very special experience for us. But it's different from the Old Testament days in the sense that, you know, like another song we sang tonight, that we are the temple of the Lord. And we don't just go to a place where God dwells or every once in a while encounter God along the way, but God dwells in us, and we're always in the presence of the Lord. When you come into a service and you experience the presence of God and you have an emotional feeling or you just discern the presence of God, it's not because God just came on the scene. God's there 100% of the time. We're dwelling in the presence of God. We're always on holy ground. It's just that sometimes we break through to where we're able to discern it. And the Lord reminded me of Luke chapter 24 about the disciples on the road to Emmaus, that there they were walking with the Lord, but they didn't discern him. They didn't know him until he sat down and broke bread with them. That's when they had it revealed. But they were in the presence of the Lord all the time. But they didn't have the emotional feeling, the knowledge that went along with it until their eyes were open and they were able to perceive him. So as New Testament believers, we're always, always, always on holy ground. We're uh, in the presence of the Lord. And any time we'll shut our senses down or sensitize our senses to God, you can experience being in the presence of God. Amen? Isn't that good? That has a lot of applications. But did you know in worship a lot of times people don't know that and they do a thousand and one things trying to get into the presence of God instead of praising Him that they are in the presence of God. That's what we were doing tonight. was not trying to work something up, but just literally working ourselves. It, the Bible talks about laboring to enter into that rest. Amen. It doesn't make sense to the natural, but it's us that has to labor to rest. Amen. To recognize what God's doing. Let's look over in Matthew chapter 14. And tonight, um, we're going to take off in another direction. I tell you, this is the strangest thing I've ever done on ministering on the love of God. We've ministered on some things that I wouldn't have normally thought we were going to minister on concerning the love of God. But did you know it really has been concerning the love of God? Matter of fact, keep your finger there in Matthew 14. We'll look at a scripture that will kind of sum up what we've been doing. First Peter, or Second Peter chapter 1. We'll come back to Matthew 14. Second Peter chapter 1. In verse 1 it says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Many people are wanting grace and peace. All of us want peace. You know, people are spending millions of dollars today trying to get peace. They're trying to get it out of a bottle or whatever, amen. It's a lot of money and effort being spent on peace. And Christians will lots of times come and ask and pray for peace and pray for all of these things. But the Bible says that it comes through the knowledge of Him. If you don't have peace, it's because you have your mind stayed on the wrong thing. As it says in Isaiah 26, 3, it says, The Lord will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon thee because he trusteth in thee. And so if you aren't having peace, it's not the fact that you haven't prayed hard enough or asked God for it. You don't ask for peace. Peace is a byproduct of keeping your mind stayed upon God. Peace is a byproduct of the knowledge of God. Do you all see that? If you're having a lack of peace, if you're distressed in any area of your life, it's because you have not kept your mind stayed upon God. It's impossible for you to think on what the devil's doing and have peace. If you are looking at the economic situation, if you're listening to the news and the evil reports that are coming out, and if that's what you keep your mind stayed upon, it's impossible for you to have peace, regardless of whether you know scriptures about it or whatever. You've got to keep your mind stayed on God. Does everybody follow that? Well, that's powerful teaching. And then in verse 3, it says, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Everything, it says all things, have been given unto us through the knowledge of him. Everything that you receive from God comes through a knowledge of God. Without knowledge, you can't believe. Faith is based on knowledge. Faith is not something you ask for. Faith is not something that you have somebody lay hands on and it's imparted unto you. Faith is not something that you work up, that you force, that any of these things. Faith comes out of knowledge. If you've got the wrong knowledge, you are going to have the wrong faith. Actually, you'll have fear if you've got the wrong knowledge. Faith is totally based on knowledge. Healing is based on knowledge. All things that pertain unto life and godliness come out of knowledge. 
And the Bible says, I believe it's Proverbs chapter 29, that my people perish for a lack of knowledge. We have not had the knowledge of God in us. And sad to say, a lot of the knowledge about God that we do have is not correct knowledge. It's been misinterpreted, misunderstood, or whatever. So therefore, you can't believe right if you got wrong knowledge. Everybody follow that? Well, I could spend a lot of time verifying this. I just have to drop it and go on because we got a lot of ground to cover. But it's important that you recognize this, that knowledge, correct knowledge, is a key to receiving everything. It is not just getting in your prayer closet and praying. Now, prayer is important, but prayer is only important if you are acting on the knowledge of God. There are people that have gotten their prayer closet and prayed and have come out demon-possessed. Anytime you go to exalting anything above the knowledge of God, which is the Word of God, you're headed for trouble. And prayer, there's nothing wrong with prayer, and there's certainly nothing wrong with intercession, but it's got to be balanced with the Word of God. It's got to be praying the Word of God and operating in the Word of God. Nothing supersedes the Word of God. Nothing works unless it's based on God's Word, because God's Word is His knowledge. Everything comes out of knowledge. If you aren't well tonight, did you know you got a knowledge problem? If you really understood the atonement of the Lord, if you really understood the love of the Lord, if you really understood faith, there is no reason for you not to be healed. It's not just enough to know that it's God's will to heal you, but you've got to go on beyond that and counter the wrong knowledge that we've got in us, that maybe God will leave you sick to, make, um, uh, leave you sick to teach you something. Maybe it's God's way of perfecting you like Job, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, knowledge is important. Now, the reason I read this verse is to say that we've made a kind of a strange approach toward love. We've been talking about grace. We've been talking about the old and the new covenants and harmonizing it. We've been doing a lot of things. And somebody might wonder how this applies to love. But what we've actually been doing is giving us correct knowledge, redefining some things, going back and straightening out some misconceptions that we've had in the Word of God. Wrong knowledge because you can't receive love unless you've got the right knowledge about God. If you think God is a schizophrenic God that under the Old Covenant did things this way and under the New Covenant does it this way, and if you don't understand that, it's going to make you afraid of God. Fear has torment, but God's perfect love cast out fear. So we've been dealing with things that I believe, even though it, it, to some people it may not look like we've been talking about love, I really believe that it's important to renew our mind in these areas so that we can understand and receive the love of God. When you start talking about the grace of God, then you're talking about the love of God because that's all that made him operating grace towards us. Amen? It's just the fact that he loved us and chose to love us. In Matthew chapter 14, I wanted to take the example of Peter walking on the water as an illustration also of what we've been talking about. And it's a familiar passage of Scripture. I believe it starts in verse 22 where Jesus told his disciples to get into the ship. And as they were in the midst of the ship, Jesus was on the land praying and as they were in the middle of the ocean um, or the sea, the winds came up. They had a terrible storm, and they were about to drown. And Jesus comes walking to them on the water in the fourth watch, which means that was between 3 and 6 a.m. And so they had been out there all night long. They had been out there for at least eight hours battling this storm, and these guys were about to die. Jesus comes walking unto them. And Peter sees him walking on the water, and he said, Lord, if that's you, bid me come unto you on the water. And he said, Come. And Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind and the waves boisterous, he was afraid, and he began to sink. And he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord reached out and lifted him up, and they walked back to the boat. And I'm convinced Jesus didn't carry Peter back to the boat. He got up and walked all the way back with Jesus' help. And then the Lord said to him, he said, Peter, why did you doubt? Now, I was meditating on this one day, and it just dawned on me. What was Peter doubting? Peter wasn't doubting that Jesus could walk on the water. He was doubting that he could walk on the water. He was doubting himself. This is what's happened to the body of Christ. Did you know that, men, many of us would stand there and if I said, do you believe that God's a miracle worker? Like we were singing, we sang two songs tonight out of Exodus chapter 15 about I will sing unto the Lord for he hath triumphed gloriously. And the other one, you know, about what, has, what was the other one? Who is like unto thee, O Lord our God? That's a song that they sang after going through the Red Sea, praising how powerful God was. Did you know most of us can get into praising God for who He is? Most of us believe that God can do anything. If I was to ask you how many believe that God can heal, man, you'd stand and shout with the best of them. But did you know that that's not all that there is to faith? 
Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says, Without faith it's impossible to please God. For those who come to Him must believe that He is, that's one part, you must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of them who diligently seek Him. So there's, there's more than one part to faith. The first part is believing that God is, not that God was, but that God is. That's praising God and saying, God, who's like unto thee? You can do anything. That's great. But did you know you've got to go beyond that and believe that it'll work for you? That's the second part of faith, and that's where a lot of people miss it. A lot of people believe God can do it, but they don't believe they can do it because they don't know their position with God. They don't know God's attitude towards them. They doubt themselves. Peter doubted himself. He didn't doubt that Jesus could walk on water because he cried out to Jesus when he was in hell. Now, if he was doubting that Jesus was really walking on water, if he thought that was just a spirit that he saw, he wouldn't have cried out to that spirit to save him. He believed Jesus could walk on water, but he doubted that he could walk on water. And that's where the body of Christ has been. We have doubted ourselves. I'm not talking about our natural selves. We have doubted our born-again self. We haven't known who we are in Christ Jesus. We haven't understood that. And so we've been dealing with that from kind of a strange standpoint, strange viewpoint this week. But we've been dealing with what has God done in our life? How has God set us free? And we've been talking about that. And I tell you, I'm, uh, I just believe that we've said some things, especially like last night, that if you listened, it could change your life. I really believe that. It could change your entire attitude and impression of God. It certainly has mine. And it's been a blessing. Let's look over in Hebrews chapter 4. And again tonight, I'd thought to go on to some other things, but the Lord, I believe, is just having me slow down, and we're going to hit this again. We're going to share some things, and this time we're going to use illustrations in the Bible to show some of these same truths that we've been talking about, because this is so contrary, so crossways to most of our teaching and thinking that I don't believe just one time is enough to get it. We need to go over this and over it. And so I'm going to say this so many different ways. Praise God. Everybody's going to get it. Amen. And we'll get it so good that we won't lose it. Here in Hebrews chapter 4. And let me just sum this up by saying that he's talking here about how Jesus is better than the Old Testament, that he's greater than angels or any of these things. And then he begins to talk in Hebrews chapter 3 about the children of Israel who came out of the land of Egypt, but they died in the wilderness. They never entered into the promised land that God had given them because of their unbelief. So then he starts off in chapter 4 verse 1 by saying, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. So he's likening us as being in a spiritual journey, just exactly the same as the Israelites were, and the same as they came out of the land of Egypt, but they never really entered into where God wanted them to be. He is saying that it's possible for you to be born again and even spirit-filled and not enter into that place where God wants you to be. And he's going to use this term about a rest to describe a special relationship that God has intended for us. This rest is not depicting the spirit-filled life. Now, I believe it's including the spirit-filled life, but that's not what it's talking about. You can be spirit-filled and still not enter into the rest, into this special relationship that God has for you. It's also not talking about death, amen, or going to be with the Lord. That's not what it's talking about. This is talking about something that we obtain to in this life. And as we read through this, you'll see it. And so he's making a comparison between us and the Old Testament Israelites, and he says, let us fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, just like it was to them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Brothers and sisters, this word right here gives us access to a relationship with God that none of the Old Testament saints could obtain. It gives us access to a relationship with God that most New Testament saints have not obtained. But it will not work automatically. Faith has to be mixed with this Word. We've got the Word. We've got the instruction. We've got the keys to walking with God in a way that no other people have ever been able to do. But we've got to mix faith with it. We've got to get rid of traditions and doctrines of man and operate in faith or it won't work for us. In verse 3, For we which have believed do enter into rest. In other words, this is God's plan for every saint. 
This is not just for a super saints, for a select few. But if you're a believer, this is what you're entering into. This is where God's leading you. Now, whether you get there or not is not uh, God's fault, but this is God's plan and desire for every one of us. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. And right here, he's making a quotation back to Psalms chapter 95 and verse 11. He's using Old Testament scripture that prophesied entering into this rest with the Lord. And he goes back and quotes that. In verse 4, he says, For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, referring back to Psalms 95 verse 11, If they shall enter into my rest. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again he limited a certain day, saying in David, and again he quotes Psalms 95 verse 11, Today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Now what he's doing, he's talking to Jews, and Jews had spiritualized this journey of the Israelites out of the land of Egypt and going into the promised land. They had been spiritualizing this for entering into a relationship with God for a long time. But they thought that when the children of Israel entered the promised land that they had obtained this rest, that it was, they thought it was a, a picture of entering into the place that God had for them. But the writer of Hebrews right here is saying, look, it wasn't fulfilled when the Jews entered the promised land. That wasn't the fulfillment of it. And in verse 8, he further verifies that by saying, for if Jesus had given them rest, and this word Jesus is speaking of Joshua. Joshua and Jesus are the same word. One of them is Hebrew and one of them is Greek. Jesus is Greek. And you can verify that in Acts chapter 7. It's talking about, it uses the word Jesus referring to Joshua. And you know it's Joshua because it talks about him as being Moses' replacement that led the children of Israel into the land of promise. Amen. How many know that wasn't Jesus, the Son of God? All right. So Jesus here is, it's talking about Joshua. If Jesus or Joshua had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? What he's saying is the children of Israel entered into the promised land and inherited it something like 400 years or 450 years before David came along. David's the one that wrote Psalms 95 verse 11 and said that there remains a rest of the people of God. So he said all of this to say that, look, there is a special relationship that the writer here is calling a rest, and it remains for us today. It wasn't for the Jews. It wasn't fulfilled when they entered the promised land. But it is a relationship that God has for the New Testament believer. That's where every believer is intended to go. And it has not yet been obtained. Verse 9, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. So tonight I want to go through and just explain this relationship that Hebrews chapter 4 is talking about, a, a relationship with God that the Bible describes as a rest. And it's something that is reserved for every believer, but not every believer enters into it. And this is an illustration of what we were talking about last night. This is the exact same thing, just from a different standpoint. All right, the first thing in understanding about this rest, I meditated on this scripture for years, wondering, God, what's this rest? What's this relationship that he's talking about? And I had trouble understanding this because when I thought of rest, I thought of getting tired, laying down, and going to sleep. That's what I was thinking of rest. And I was thinking, God, what kind of relationship is there that I can enter into where I no longer will have to fast and pray and study the Word or ever do anything, you know, you just lay down and things automatically work. Go to sleep, lay back, sip Cokes, you know, goof off, and it just automatically works. And I thought there was, I thought that there was some kind of relationship that you could just get into where things just worked. You didn't have to struggle anymore. Well, that's not what this is talking about. The word rest here is not talking about that. And you can prove that because it starts talking about in verse 4 that God spake of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest from all of his labors. It's talking about when God created the heavens and earth, he took a rest from creation. Now, if you meditate on what rest means there, that rest isn't talking about that God was worn out. Poor old God, he'd created a heaven and an earth and a universe, and I mean, he'd bound to have been tired. So God had to take a rest. No, I didn't talking about that he was tired and he couldn't have created one more world. That's talking about that he simply ceased from his labors. 
I began to look this up and study it, and the word rest is used in a lot of different ways. But like, say, for instance, a, a, an artist is painting a picture. He paints it, and when he sees that it's perfect, or as close to perfect as he can get it, I mean, there's nothing more that he can do than he rests from his labors. That doesn't mean that he's worn out, can't lift his arm up from lifting that heavy paintbrush all day. That just simply talks about that he ceases to do anything about it because it's complete. It's finished. And if you'll look at creation, let's look over here in Genesis chapter 2 and take a look at creation. You'll see that this is the kind of rest that God took. In Genesis chapter 2 verse 1, thus the heavens and the earth were finished. That means they were complete. There wasn't anything else to do. And all the host of them, and on the seventh day, God ended his work. He quit his work. Not because there was anything else left to do and he just had to take a rest before he could do anything else. He quit and he rested simply because it was complete. It was finished. So he ended his work which he had made and he rested on the seventh day from all of his work which he had made and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all of his work which God created and made. So God did not take a rest from exertion, but rather a rest from completion. Everything was done, and so he didn't have to do anymore. There wasn't anything else to do. Now, as you look back in the first chapter of Genesis at the creation, there's a number of things to notice about creation. That when God created things, he created things in a complete fashion. Did you know that if most of us would have been creating, all right, we probably would have made a mess of the thing and we would have had to have kept creating the rest of our days. For instance, if we created trees and if we had the ability to create trees, most of us probably wouldn't have thought about putting in those trees seeds and having fruit that is able to reproduce seeds and those seeds reproduce and just keep the creation going. But Jesus, when he spoke the trees into existence, created them in a very special way. Let's look over here in Genesis, the first chapter, and look in verse 11. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. Now notice the way that this is put. Again, most of us, if we had the ability to speak things into existence, we probably would have said, Let there be trees, let there be grass, let there be herbs. Right? Well, wouldn't that be great? But God didn't say it that way. And God doesn't just say things to waste words. Notice the way he said it. Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. God made quite a bit of mention of the tree bringing forth after itself, bringing forth seeds and all of this. Now, by speaking it that way, he created everything by words. And by speaking it that way, God not only created the universe, but he gave the creation the command to procreate or to continue creation. Now, this is really important because after God created the first trees, did you know he has never had to create a, create a tree since? Did you know when God created the first cow, he has never had to create a cow since? Those cows are continuing to reproduce. He has never had to recre uh, recreate a horse, a pig, or anything. God made the original creation, and the original creation is continuing to produce. Now, this has a lot of applications. You know, one of the things that I've learned out of this, I've seen some people that, like, say, for instance, in the area of having children, they say, well, I'm just going to have as many children as God wants me to have. They don't use any birth control. They don't abstain. They don't do anything. They say, well, we won't have a child unless God wants us to have a child. And I've had some people that are very sincere that believe that. But did you know that that is not the way it is? God doesn't just look down on the union of a man and woman and say, well, I'm going to bless you. And so he creates a child in the womb. God gave you the ability to create. You have the ability to continue to create, not in the same sense that God made the original creation out of nothing, but out of the laws that God has already set in motion, God gave you the ability to procreate, continue creation. And did you know that that's the reason that harlots have children? That's the reason that prostitutes have children. That's the reason that people who are sorry parents have children. 
Because God doesn't look down and say, all right, I'm going to bless you with the child. God created the original parents. He gave to every physical human being that has ever been born the ability to continue that creation. And if you set the laws of God in motion, unless something's wrong with you, you are going to recreate. God does not just bless the harlots and the prostitutes and the unfit parents with children. Everybody follow that? They have access to the laws of God. And so what I'm saying is, if you don't want to have 20 kids, you better use wisdom. Amen? <laughs> it's not just a matter of God saying, all right, I've willed that you have three children, four children, or whatever. No, he gave you power and you decide what you're going to do with that. All right? So, see, God gave us the ability to continue the creation. Now, the reason I say that is because when God created things, He created them so complete. Did you know He has never had to create another cow? He's never had to create another horse. He's never had to create another tree, another blade of grass. God has never had to create anything since creation because of the way that He did it. Now, that's the reason that God rested because He didn't have to get up the next morning on the seventh day and say, all right, let these trees reproduce. Let there be new trees today. He didn't have to do that on the hundredth year, the thousandth year, because when he created, he created it to continue to work. So there was really nothing left for God to do. When God created things, he created it so perfectly with such a perfect system that he didn't even have to make it run. God doesn't have to sit there and keep everything in balance. His word created it to maintain a balance. And it just itself runs. God created it in a way it just continues to go. Now that further illustrates the rest that God took. This rest that God took wasn't I'm tired, but rather he rested because it was complete. There was nothing left to do. He made creation so complete that even God had nothing left to do to make the heavens and the universe operate. God doesn't have to sit up there and keep his calculator out to make the earth revolving at the right speed and going around the sun and make sure it's the proper distance. He created it, and it works that way because he spoke it that way. He's never had to do a thing about it since then. Why isn't that powerful? Boy, the wisdom of God is so far beyond our wisdom. If we'd have had the ability to create worlds, we would have created a mess. We'd have created a problem that would have worn us out and killed us within the first two or three weeks trying to keep it all going and maintained and everything else. Boy, God uses wisdom. And also notice that when God created man, he created man on the sixth day. And the days, according to the uh, Hebrew time, and you can see this here in the book of Genesis chapter 1, it it's always says like in verse 13, it says the evening and the morning were the third day. And in verse 19, the evening and the morning were the fourth day, etc. They always reckon time from evening until the next evening. We reckon time from 12 midnight until 12 midnight, but they reckoned it from sundown one day until sundown the next day. So the point that I'm making is the first day went from sundown, or there wasn't actually a sun the first day, but if there had been, let's say the third day. The third day went from sundown until sundown the next day, okay? And so that's the way the Jewish calendar works. So when it says that God created man on the sixth day, that means he created him sometime between uh, sundown on the fifth day, I mean, after the fifth day, what we would reckon the fifth day, all right? Let me get my thinking straight on this. Seventh day is Saturday, all right? So that means that he created man what we would call Thursday evening, between Thursday evening and Friday evening, okay? And remember that on Friday evening is when the seventh day would have begun. The Sabbath, the seventh day, would have begun Friday evening. Now, let's also suppose, and this is just nothing but supposing, but let's suppose that God created man during the daylight hours on the sixth day so that he wouldn't have been created in the dark. All right? I mean, I think that's reasonable. And so it's very possible that God created man in the last 12 hours of the sixth day. Now, the reason I'm saying that is to say that God had a specific purpose when he created the man. It was not random. Again, if we'd have been creating we probably would have started with the hardest thing first, which was mankind. We would have made our crowning jewel first. We would have created him on the first day of creation, and he would have had to tread water for three days until there was land to stand on. Amen. 
or we would have had him created, you know, and all of a sudden, boom, here's a tree, and here's a rock, and here's a mountain, and he would have been dodging all these trees and rocks and mountains, or we would have created him, and he would have had to wait four days to have any food to eat. When God created Adam and Eve, he did it with a very specific purpose in mind. It was the last thing. Why? Because there was already land. There was already water. There was already trees. There was already fruit. God had already made this whole creation for Adam and Eve, and he created them at the end of his creation, and I personally believe it was at the very end. I mean, during the last few hours of his creating, he was the very last thing to be done. And immediately after their creation, God entered into the seventh day or into the rest. That means Adam and Eve entered into this rest of God too. Because did you know they didn't have anything to do? They weren't created and then they had to go out and plant a seed and start tilling the ground and waiting on a harvest. God had already created it all. Everything was already done. The fruit was already there. Everything was complete for them. Adam and Eve didn't have to do anything. It was complete. They entered into this rest of God where they didn't have to do anything to obtain from God. Now, this is important that you get this point. God was doing nothing because he was resting. His, his creation was complete, so complete he didn't have to maintain it. Adam and Eve were created and then entered immediately into this rest of God where everything was complete for them. They didn't have to go do anything except reach out and receive. Now, they had to do something in the sense that if they just would have laid down and said, all right, God, you bring it to me, it never would have worked that way. God wasn't going to pick the fruit, put it in their mouth, make them chew it, and then digest it. But they had to do something, but it wasn't working. It wasn't laboring for anything. It was just simply reaching out, saying thank you, and taking it. Amen. So they entered into a special relationship that God had provided everything for them. There was no sweat. And I heard a man minister this one time, and I can't verify these things, but he was saying that before the fall, there was no such thing as sweat. You know, the Bible talks about man having to live by the sweat of his brow. And he was saying that that was a part of the curse. And he brought in, and I'm just throwing these things out as maybe, all right? You can take this as andeology. I don't know all of this, but in the Levitical priesthood, the priest could not sweat. That was forbidden for them to sweat. And they lived in a hot climate, and they went through the desert, and they wore special clothes, linen, that kept sweat away from them. They were forbidden to sweat. And so he was bringing in that sweat was a result of the fall. After the fall, man had to start doing things by their effort and by their power because they were no longer in this special rest, this special relationship where God had already yeah. provided it. They were having to provide on their own. They were having to do it through their own effort. All right, I don't know if all that's true, but it sure sounds good. Yeah. Amen. It seems like it fits. So they had this special relationship with God called a rest. In the New Covenant, well, before we get to the New Covenant and explain in Hebrews chapter 4, let me, let me also take you through the Sabbath because the Sabbath was re remembering, reminding people of this rest that God took on creation. And the real purpose of the Sabbath, again, this is something else, see, that's been misunderstood. Most of us thought that there was some day that God forbid us to work. Well, there, in the Old Covenant, there was uh, a forbidding of work on the Sabbath day, and it was strictly enforced. But it was only a picture. It was only a type of this relationship that was prophesied and was fulfilled in Hebrews chapter 4. The Sabbath, the observance of not working and keeping that day separate to God, the actual observance was not the thing. It was only a picture, a shadow of something that was to come. Let's look over here in Colossians chapter 2 and read about this Sabbath. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 16, it says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Verse 17 very clearly states that these five things, which the Sabbath day was one of them, that they are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Now, a shadow of something that's to come, in other words, a shadow proves that there is something out there. 
But the shadow is not that thing itself. It's only a representation of something else. Say, for instance, if there was a corner of a building right here, and if Larry was around the other side of this corner, and he couldn't see me because he got this building in the way, and so therefore he couldn't see me. But if there's a light behind me, and if I'm standing real close to that corner, and my shadow was sh shining in front of me, you know, around that corner. Larry could see my shadow, and even though he didn't see me, he would know I was coming because he could see that shadow. Everybody follow that? Well, before Jesus was brought into view, before he was in manifestation, God gave types and shadows throughout the Old Testament that were pictures of Jesus, pictures of what the new covenant and this new relationship with God was going to be. And that's what the Sabbath was. The Sabbath was a shadow. Now, before the person gets there, the shadow is important because it's proof to you that that person's coming, that he's on his way. But once the person walks around the corner of the building, if you look down at his shadow and say, oh, I'm so glad for you to be here, and you get all excited over that shadow, something's wrong with you. That shadow is not the person. That shadow is just a representation or a, a product of that person. And see, there's some people that have gotten so caught up with the observance of a Sabbath day that they missed Jesus, who the Sabbath was prophesying. And they are still caught up into observing the Sabbath day and adhering to it. There's denominations formed over the Sabbath day, over keeping the Sabbath day. Did you know if you're going to keep the Sabbath day that the Sabbath day is not Sunday? The Sabbath day is Saturday. If you're going to keep the Sabbath, you're going to have to become a Seventh-day Adventist. But did you know Seventh-day Adventists aren't keeping the Sabbath? They're honoring a day, but they're dishonoring God. They're dishonoring what Hebrews chapter 4 is talking about. The Sabbath is only a picture of a relationship that we're just about to explain. Let's look back in verse 16 here, Colossians chapter 2. He says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat. Let's look at these five things. The first thing he says, Don't let people judge you over is meat. This is referring to, under the Old Testament, there were dietary laws, certain meats that you could eat and certain that you couldn't, clean and unclean animal. The most popular or well-known is the swine, the pigs. Jews could not eat any type of pork at all. And you can see in the Hebrews, the I mean, excuse me, in Acts chapter 10 and 11, about, um, who was that, Peter, you know, that went through these animals being let down in the sheet and on and on. And there's, there's a lot of scriptures that verify that. They could not eat certain types of meat. Did you know that that was only a type and a shadow of something to come in the New Testament? Now, many people will teach you today, no, sir, brother, these dietary laws under the Old Testament were more than types and shadows. There were reasons God gave that, because if you ate that meat, you could die. And they'll tell you that if you eat certain types of meat today, you're going to die, that it was given because it was health food. God was showing us health things through that. Now, there may have been some benefit to that. For instance, pork if it's not cooked, well done, has a uh, virus in it or something, I don't know, a germ in it that they call trichinosis, you'll catch this disease through it. And so there could have been a double meaning to some of these things, okay? But those are secondary things. The Bible makes it clear that the dietary laws were mainly a shadow of something that was to come. The New Testament counterpart to this is found over in the book of Colossians. I won't take time to turn over there, but the New Testament counterpart says, whatsoever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. The real purpose of the dietary laws was not that God hated pigs. He created pigs the same as he created anything else, amen. And God hadn't got anything against pigs or camels or any of the other things that you aren't supposed to eat. You know, you aren't supposed to eat rabbits according to all of this. God doesn't have anything against those. The real purpose of these dietary laws was to tell people that you are supposed to be separated unto me in every area, even in what you eat, even in your physical realm. You're supposed to glorify God in what you eat. And so therefore, to prove it, there were certain things God said, don't ever eat these, not because there was anything wrong with them, but to symbolize, to show that they were supposed to be separated to God in every area of their life. Did you know Christians still need that today? There's a lot of Christians that are fat and overweight, and I'm not condemning anybody, okay? I'm overweight. A little bit of sin is not better than a lot of sin, amen? I'm not a lot overweight, but I'm overweight. I'm not condemning you, and I'm not condemned, but we are supposed to glorify God in our bodies. Nobody accidentally ever got fat. 
If you're overweight, you've never accidentally eaten anything. You decided to eat everything you've ever eaten, and you did not glorify God in your body. God told you to glorify God in your body and in your soul, which are the Lord's. There's a New Testament counterpart. That was just an Old Testament symbolism for something that we're supposed to still have today in the reality of it, okay? And anybody that says, no, sir, brother, you still got to adhere to these Old Testament laws, they're missing the point. There's a New Testament scripture, I won't take time to turn to it, but 1 Timothy chapter 4 says that in the last days men would depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of the devils. Let me read this. This is so strong. I better read this or y'all. Praise God. I'm glad that the Lord said this, and I don't have to say it. Praise God. People will sure get on my case. 1 Timothy 4.1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And he's fixing to tell you what's a doctrine of the devil. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with the hot iron, forbidding to marry. That's a doctrine of the devil. Do you know any groups that practice celibacy and that you cannot be a minister or a priest in their organization if you marry? It's a doctrine of the devil. Amen. I'm glad God said that and not me. Amen. <laughs> Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. Do you know anybody that commands you to abstain from meats? It's a doctrine of the devil. Did you know that there are spirit-filled Christians that will tell you you can't eat certain things? Matter of fact, I had somebody write into me once when I was ministering on the radio on this, and they said, well, brother, you may still go to heaven and eat pork, but you'll get there quicker. Amen. <laughs> They were saying that pork's going to kill you. That's the reason God told you not to eat of it. No, it was a shadow of something to come. And if you are commanding people to abstain from meats, trying to adhere to Old Testament law, you're operating under a doctrine of the devil because that was only a shadow of something that was to come. The New Testament reality is that you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your soul, which are the Lord's. Amen? God... It says, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. That ought to put an end to all of that controversy about what you eat. Amen. All right, back to Second, I mean, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 16. So therefore, don't let any man judge you in meat or in drink. In the same way as there were dietary laws concerning the meats that you ate, there were also dietary laws concerning what you drank. You could only drink certain things. How many of you know what those were? Well, if nobody knows what they were, you must not believe that you have to adhere to those today, do you? They were only a shadow of something to come. Again, we need to glorify God in what we drink. We don't need to let our body and our lust control us, but we need to control them. It says, or in respect of an holy day. How come you didn't observe it? I am observing the Passover. The Passover was a picture of Jesus dying, being the Passover lamb, and I am observing the Passover every day of my life by loving Jesus, by being a part of him. I am in the literal fulfillment of the Passover. Amen? And I don't have to observe that feast because it was only a type, a shadow of something that was to come. It also says, don't let any man judge you in respect of the new moon. Did you know that every new moon you had to offer sacrifices, blood sacrifices every new moon? How many of you offered a blood sacrifice last new moon? How many of you know when the last new moon was? Well, see, that was only a shadow of something to come. That was a reminder that every month of the year, every day of the year, everything, you had to be covered by the blood of the Lord Jesus. We're living in the fulfillment of that every day of my life. God, that sacrifice that Jesus made for me covered every new moon throughout all history. It covered the morning ob oblation and the evening oblation, the year of atonement, the day of atonement, all of the feast days. Everything has been fulfilled in the Lord Jesus. And I'm honoring these sacrifices, the new moon, through honoring Jesus. All right? So here's five things listed. Four of them we've conclusively proved. I believe everybody would agree with those four that those four things are not still observed in the strictness and in the letter of the law because those were only types and shadows and they were pointing to a relationship that is now a reality in Christ Jesus. So everybody would agree with that. Four of those things are for sure fulfilled, but the Sabbath day, did you know most Christians are still hung up on that? Some of you may not have been very religious, but if you were religious, 
you have had it crammed into you that, man, you had better not do anything on the Sabbath day. That's God's day. I know that I was raised in a home where we didn't wash clothes on the Sabbath day. We did wash dishes. I never did figure that out, but we would wash dishes. But you couldn't wash clothes. You couldn't mow the lawn. You couldn't do any work on the Sabbath day, which we said was Sunday, which isn't the Sabbath. But we couldn't do anything. And I remember when I first started pastoring a church, we, we held church on Sunday afternoon from about 1.30 until 6 o'clock or something. We had more church in the afternoon than any of the other churches had on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night all put together. But did you know because I didn't go to church on Sunday morning, even though I knew with my head it was right and that I wasn't dishonoring God, I mean, I just felt like the wrath of God was going to fall on me any time. I had been programmed that that Sunday morning was going to church and that that was honoring God. That was God's day. And I hadn't missed church up until that time in my entire life. Never. I went when I was sick and whatever. And I, here I was, a pastor of a church. And all of these people around, I'd been witnessing to them. And on Sunday morning, I'd put my car in the garage and pull the shades down because I didn't want them to know I was staying home on Sunday morning. I was honoring God, but I was so worried about what other people would think. I was still had this concept of the Sabbath having to go to a place and to do these things. You know, that is not what the Sabbath is. The Sabbath is only a picture. The picture that the Sabbath portrays is it goes back to the rest that God took. God commanded his people through Moses to keep the Sabbath day. And did you know at that time there was no other group of people on the face of the earth that took one day out of seven off? Today, it's become a thing that's done not only in America, but there's other places that will do it. And it's, and it's just a health type thing sometimes. It's just a way of taking a break, a holiday or whatever. But to the Jews, it was totally a religious observance. The world had no idea what they were doing. I mean, here they were, working by the sweat of their brow, doing everything they could to eke a living out of the earth. They were giving it all they got, and here comes along this entire nation that one out of seven days they just take off, and they're producing and bringing forth more fruit and being more blessed than these nations that are working by the sweat of their brow. You know what that was a picture of? That was a picture of that they weren't trusting their own labors. They had labor. But they weren't trusting their labor. They were actually trusting God. To the natural mind, they could have been out there, and if you can do good in six days, you could have done better in seven days. That's the way the natural man thinks. But see, they were thinking spiritually, and they were saying, God, it's not my effort that's bringing in this prosperity. It's my faith in you. And to prove that faith in you, I'll even cut back one of my days and trust you to make up the difference. And God did it. It was a testimony that they were resting in God, that they were trusting God for prosperity and not trusting their effort. And then also there was a Sabbath of years. Did you not, not only did they take one day out of seven off, but every seven years they took a year off. God told them to take the entire year off. Did you know that in the Old Testament that was never observed? Did you know that the Jews never kept the Sabbath year? which is a shame. And, and the Bible even goes on to say, as judgment fell upon them, that this is one reason that God brought judgment on the nation of Israel and sent them into captivity because he says, now my land will enjoy her Sabbath and rest and bring forth her increase. God brought judgment on them for not keeping this. But he gave them a command to keep every seven years. And I forget where this is. I used to know where that is. But anyway... In the Old Covenant, it outlines all of the details of it. And every seventh year, they had to take the entire year off. They couldn't sow any crops, and they couldn't reap anything that grew of itself. They had to let the fields lay totally idle for the beast of the field to come in, and they had to do nothing. Now, you talk about one day out of seven blowing people away. Here's the nations of the world doing everything they can to bring forth their harvest, you know, working and struggling. And here's the Jews taking one day out of seven off, and then one out of seven years they take off. And on that seventh year, the Bible says that in the, well, actually in the sixth year, what would happen, God promised them that if you'll take the seventh year off in the sixth year, I'll give you three times a normal crop, enough to last you through the sixth year, enough to last you through the seventh year, and also take you through the eighth year while you're waiting on your crops that you sowed in the eighth year to come up. Now, that's nothing but supernatural. They did the exact same amount of work in the sixth year 
that they did in the fifth year, but in the sixth year it brought forth three times as much food. I mean, that's supernatural. That wasn't their effort that made the difference. It was the blessings of God that were making the difference. And the Sabbath was a picture of them. It reminded them and it reminded the nations of the world that, look, you may be working, but it's not your work that's producing. It's God. It's your covenant with God that makes you prosperous. And it was a reminder to them. It was a type and a shadow of something that was to come. Now, in the New Testament, what all of this pointed to and what we now can enter into a special relationship with God is that God has made a new creation. The only thing that God has ever created since he created the heavens and the earth and mankind and the trees and all of this, the only other creation that God has ever made is a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5:17. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature or a new creation. The new birth is the only other act of creation that God has ever made. And when a person comes to the Lord Jesus and confesses Him as their Lord, they get born again. They get totally changed. And did you know that when you get changed, you are complete. You are completely changed. Colossians chapter 2 verse 9 says that we are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. That's a combination of Colossians 2 9 and Colossians 1 19. Also it says of His fullness have all we received in John 1 16 and on and on you could go. When you get born again, God made that new creation on the inside of you complete. Complete in exactly the same way as He made the first creation complete so that he didn't have to do anything to make it continue to work on the ninth, the 10th, the 11th, the 12th day. He made it complete. There was nothing left to do. Did you know in your spirit, man, you are complete. And that complete, and I'm going to say some things here. I don't know how Larry teaches, okay, and I'm not criticizing anybody. I'm just saying I've never heard anybody it pre presents this the way I do. If we disagree, you just take mine as andeology and go with your pastor until he has time to verify it or whatever, all right? I'm not trying to cause problems. Uh, we, you know, nobody agrees totally. I don't agree with myself totally, praise God. <laughs> so if you don't like this, just chunk it or set it aside and think about it. But I believe that when we're created, that we aren't com created complete like a baby in the sense that we've got all five fingers and all, I mean, ten fingers and ten toes, that, but they're in baby form and they've got to grow. I believe that your spirit is complete, and that means completely grown, completely mature, complete in every area, that your spirit is not having to be grown, matured, nurtured. You aren't teaching your spirit things. You aren't getting your spirit renewed your spirit's complete. The part that's being renewed is the mind. Now, there is a growth process. The Bible talks about as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. But what's growing is your soul. Your soul is growing in its ability to perceive who you are in Christ Jesus. You're growing in your ability to release what you've already got. But in your spirit, you've already got the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In your spirit, you've already got all of the faith that you'll ever get. You'll never get more faith. You'll get an ability to use more faith as you renew your mind and walk in it. You'll never get more peace. You'll get more peace operative as you renew your mind, according to these scriptures we started with in first, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Grace and peace is multiplied unto you through the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But the point that I'm making is your spirit is complete. Everything's already been given to you. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He says it's already an accomplished fact. You don't have to pray for God's blessing. God's blessings have already been placed on you. All you got to do is release what God has put in you. And it goes back, a perfect parallel, see, to Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve didn't have to do anything to make their needs be supplied. Their needs were already supplied and all they had to do was reach out and receive what was already there. Now, boy, this is a powerful truth. This is a powerful truth. Very few Christians have entered into this rest, into a relationship where they understand the new creation. They think that they are making healing come by their faith. They think that when I release faith, then God gives healing. No, healing is already there, just like those trees were already there for Adam and Eve. The tree and the fruit was already there. All they had to do was go find it, take it, and eat it. Healing has already been provided. God doesn't heal people today. 
Amen. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, that by his stripes we were healed. It's already been done. When, he, when Jesus died, everything that you'll ever receive as a result of the atonement has already been done. Just like the first creation, it's already been done. God is resting at this time. He's not up there saving people today. He's already made the atonement. Everything's been done. People are receiving salvation today. When you confess your faith in the Lord, Jesus doesn't go die for you. It was already done, and all you're doing is reaching out and taking salvation. It's the same thing with healing. You don't have to pray and say, Oh, God, heal me. And say, see, by saying, Oh, God, heal me, you're automatically supposing, What if God doesn't heal me? That has an element of doubt in it. That has a question mark after that. God, will you heal me? But the person who's truly resting in God is simply saying, Father, thank you that through Jesus, by his stripes, we were healed. It's already reality. Healing is already on the inside of me, and I don't have to wonder, God, will you heal me? Adam and Eve never got up and thought, God, will there be a tree out there today for me to get fruit from? God, will you take care of me today? See, they were confident that God had already created it and that God's creation... One of the things about God's creation is it's consistent. Man, it lasts and it lasts. God made it to continue on and it continues on. They were confident of what God had done. They were resting in God's rest. The New Testament believer is supposed to enter into a relationship where we don't say, Oh, God, heal me. That depends on what you mean by that. There's nothing wrong with asking for healing if, like... Say, for instance, if I told you I was going to give you the keys to the car out there and that you could use the car. Now, if I gave you my word and promised that, if you came up to me later and said, Andy, I don't know if you really mean it, would you please give me your keys? Did you know that would be an insult to me? Because I told you I'd give them to you. I told you it was yours. But if you simply, as a matter of politeness, say, come up and say, can I have your keys? Not, can I have your keys, question mark. But I'm ready now for the car. Would you give me your keys? If you're asking it simply as a way of demanding, like, for instance, when the Bible says in Matthew chapter 6, give us this day our daily bread, that's not a question mark after that where you say, oh, God, will you give us our daily bread today? But that's a command. Give us this day our daily bread. Come boldly before the Lord and ask and receive what's rightfully yours. So if you're asking for healing in the sense of, Father, I know it's already mine, so I receive it. Give me my healing. That's okay. But if you're saying, God, heal me, question mark, that's doubt and unbelief. You aren't resting in the fact that God has already healed you, that it's already been done. You need to recognize that God's already healed everybody that'll ever get healed. If you come and ask for healing tonight, Jesus doesn't have to get off the throne and go take stripes in his back to produce healing in your body. God has already healed you by the stripes of Jesus, and Jesus will never take another stripe for you. And if those stripes didn't heal you, God will never have to do anything or could do anything else to add to that. It's already done. It's an accomplished fact. The key to walking with God is just resting in it and not feeling like, Oh, God, I've got to fast. Oh, God, I've got to pray. Oh, God, I've got to start going to church. God, I'm going to start living right. And God, I promise you, I'm going to do what I should so that you can heal me. You aren't resting in what God has already provided. You're trying to go and earn and buy and obtain the things of God. You, are, you haven't entered into this rest of God. If you're trying to obtain peace with God by going out and saying, God, I promise you, I'll do all of these things. And if that's what you're trusting, peace will never come because you aren't resting in the Lord. A person that in this Sabbath, you know, if he was trusting his own effort, if he didn't cease from his own labors during that seventh year, if he didn't rest and, and trust what God said, did you know that that thing wouldn't work? You wouldn't get three times the increase in the sixth year to carry you through the sixth, seventh, and the eighth year. It wouldn't work unless you quit your labors and unless you trusted in God. Did you know unless you quit trusting in your labors... Unless you quit trusting in your goodness and start trusting in God and resting in what He's already accomplished, did you know you won't obtain the things of God that you're seeking after? This is so hard to verbalize and put in a way that people really get this. But we've been doing the right things with the wrong motive. We've been going to church. Go to church. It's right to go to church. Amen? And I still believe in Sunday. I still believe in keeping Sunday as a separate day and not working on Sunday. Why? Because we're keeping the Old Testament Sabbath? No. 
I'm keeping the Old Testament Sabbath by putting my faith in Jesus and resting in Him and trusting that everything that He said is already an accomplished fact and resting in it. I'm keeping the Sabbath every day of my life. The Sabbath is a relationship with God, not a day. The day was only a type, a picture of something that was to come. The Sabbath is a relationship, an experience with God. And I'm living in a continual Sabbath. I'm honoring God more by trusting in Jesus than people who are observing the day and hallowing the day and worshiping that shadow instead of worshiping who it represents. But I still keep the uh, Sunday... And I keep it separated unto God because you'd be totally foolish in a nation that is set one day aside and most people take off work and they have an opportunity to go and gather together with the believers. You'd be plumb crazy not to take advantage of it. I praise God for it. Praise God that we just separate time unto the Lord. Praise God. Your body can use the physical rest. There's a lot of advantages of it. You're totally crazy if you aren't coming together with the assembly of the saints. God commanded you to come together, not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together. I use Sunday, and I go to church, and I use it to glorify God, but I don't use it as fulfilling the Old Testament Sabbath. I fulfill that through trusting and relying on, in the Lord. Amen? So it's so hard to get people to see that, yes, we're doing the right things. Yes, go to church. Yes, study the Word. Yes, pray. Yes, intercede. Yes, do all of these things. But if you're doing them as an effort to earn these things from God instead of trusting in the fact that God already freely gave it to you, that God's new creation is complete, that your healing is already accomplished through what Jesus did. If you're doing it for any other motive other than to say, Father, I'm just doing this because it's pleasing to you, and I'm just doing this because it's right. I'm keeping Satan off my back through it. But what is obtaining the favor of God, what's blessing me is Jesus and what he did. If you're looking to anything other than that, you haven't entered into this rest. As it says there in Hebrews chapter 4, I believe verse 9, it says, He that has entered into his rest has ceased from his own labors as God did from his. What is God doing about creation? Nothing. It's already done, and he's just resting in it. God's up, not up there wringing his hands. People saying about, you know, in 200 million years, the earth is going to quit spinning at the right speed, and it may drop out of orbit, and we're liable to collide with something else. God knows better than all that stuff. Amen. He spoke the worlds into existence, and he says that his same word holds them together and reserves them until the day of judgment. Nothing's going to happen because God's commanded what's going to happen with all of this. The world's not going to be destroyed by a nuclear bomb because that's not the way God said it would happen. Amen. God's got everything in check. And I guarantee you he's not wringing his hands. He's not worried. He's not upset. He's not having to pray through. Amen. <laughs> he's not having to intercede and fast. And praise God, we need to get into a position where we rest in God. I could give you so many examples of this in my life, but just one real quickie is that our ministry's gone through some rough times. And I can't give you all the reasons for that. I'm not the whiz kid, and I don't know have all of the Bible answers, okay? I don't know all of the reasons, but we've been through some rough times financially. And in the natural, people around me who are advisors and parts of the ministry and stuff, they came to me and said, Boy, you're going to have to shut down. You can't function. They told me, businessmen told me that we were going to have to close the doors of the ministry and just quit and go home, that you can't continue to function. And did you know that there was plenty of opportunity for me to look at the circumstances and to look at the situation? And man, there was a lot of times I felt like going in and laying hold of God, grabbing hold of the horns of the altar and shaking it until God came out and saying, God, where are you? God, do something. But did you know this same thing that we're talking about just came back, came back to me thousands of times, and I never could get upset. Matter of fact, sometimes the only problem I had really through this whole thing was feeling guilty over not being upset. Everybody around me was upset. Everybody else was saying, you just, what's wrong with you? Don't you care about the ministry, whether it goes under? Don't you care? Yeah, I cared, but I honestly, I just know that God's already blessed me with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I know 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 says, For uh, the grace, you know the grace of our Lord, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might be made rich. I know that financial blessing is a part of my inheritance. And I asked for it. I know it's mine. And even though I couldn't see it, I couldn't get out of that rest. I couldn't get upset. I couldn't go to worrying and fretting because I know, I knew, and I know that it was done. 
and I just kept resting in it. Now, that didn't mean that I went to sleep. See, I had to labor to enter into this rest. You know what my laboring was? You know what my prayer and intercession was? It wasn't, oh, God, do something. No, I knew God had already done it. I was resting in that. But my prayer was, shut up, man. Shut up, fears. Amen. I cast down these thoughts. I was having to labor to enter into that rest. Not laboring with God and struggling with God, but struggling with my old flesh that wanted to get up and do something. Man, you're going down the tubes. You better do something. And I had to labor to keep my flesh just resting in God. There was a labor. There was a struggle, and I spent a lot of time praying, but I, my time praying was praying the Word and saying, Father, thank you that it is done, and I refuse to get out of that. I refuse to get into struggle. I refuse to start doing something to make the blessings of God come to pass. I've already got it, and my struggle was with me and with the devil, an unrenewed mind, and I just kept resting in God. There is a struggle in the Christian life, but it's with your old flesh and it's with the devil. It is not with God. You don't... If you need healing tonight, you don't have to grab hold of God and not let go until God heals you. God's already healed you. And don't ever move off of that. Rest in that. Your struggle will be with the devil, a demonic power that's fighting against you, or with your flesh, your unrenewed mind, that wrong knowledge in you that's making you get upset and worry and operate in fear. And you may have to pray through. You may have to spend all night in prayer. You may have to get some people to help you. You may have to labor to enter into that place of rest where you're just saying, Father, I thank you. It's already done. And I'll never doubt that. Amen? Praise God. But there is a relationship, brothers and sisters, that God wants every one of us in where we enter into a relationship where we just rest in the fact that, God, it's already done. Don't ever let the devil talk you out of that. Don't ever get over into the thing where you're studying the Word to earn the blessings of God. Instead, study the Word because you know that you've already got them and you just want to hear it again. Amen? You want to renew your mind. You want to make sure that you keep believing what God says instead of what the devil says. So go to listening to God. Amen? That's the reason I study the Word. The reason I pray is because, you know, God's fun to be with. I enjoy God. I, enjoy, I get blessed and I also bless God. I don't pray to change God. Man, if God isn't already abounding towards me through what Jesus did, nothing I can do is ever going to get him on my side. Not acting pitiful, not crying and whining and bawling and squalling, that won't move God. If Jesus didn't move him, nothing I can do will. So I pray because I enjoy talking to God. Amen? Not because I'm trying to winch something from God. Praise the Lord. The reason I come to church is because I like to come and hear things like what we're saying. You don't hear things like this at home. You don't hear things like this watching the boob tube. You need to come to where God's people are and get together and start speaking the words that God speaks. The reason I come to church is because I like to come to church because it's my family. It's people that I love, and we get to worship in God, and there's a corporate anointing that is released as people get together in prayer. But I do not come to church because God keeps record of my attendance, and when I get enough brownie points, then I'll obtain my healing. Amen. And yet there's some of you that have had that exact kind of thinking. Praise God, that's not resting in the Lord. Let's rest in the Lord. That's what the relationship that Hebrews chapter 4 is talking about. And that's what we were dealing with last night. The same thing. A relationship where, yes, you're doing things, but you aren't doing it to obtain. You're doing it because you've already obtained. You're just acting on what God's already done. Amen? Praise God. Let's stand up and pray. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your word. We praise you, Father for these scriptures, and we thank you for the Holy Ghost that explains them to us. Father, that has given every person here tonight the ability to perceive, to understand, and receive this truth. And Father, we just renounce our own efforts. Father, we ask your forgiveness tonight for not understanding this. It's exactly like we started in 2 Peter chapter 1. Verse 3, that we haven't had knowledge of these things, and so therefore we couldn't operate in it. Father, we ask your forgiveness that we haven't pressed in and seen these things. And Father, I just thank you that the wrong attitudes that have been ground into us for years and years, that Father, you're renewing them through the Word of God. I thank you, Father, that if it's taken 20 years for us to get this messed up or 40 years, that we don't have to wait another 20 or 40 years to get it out of us. But we believe in the supernatural power of God. We believe that as the Word of God goes forth, that, Father, that Word is able to save our souls, that it's able to renew us, to set us free through the truth. 
Father, we believe for a supernatural miracle. I believe that the word that's gone forth tonight is just opening our hearts up so that we'll quit trusting in ourselves. Quit working by the sweat of our brow and just go to resting in you. Go to trusting that, Father, you've already blessed us. Father, I thank you that you've already healed every person in here, that it's ours by inheritance. And whether we've done enough work to earn it or not is immaterial, that you've just blessed us with it. We rest in that tonight. Father, we rest that every cancer, every heart problem, every sickness, every disease of every sort has already been taken care of. And Father, we refuse to be held off to keep from receiving it simply because we haven't done enough. We rest in you. We look to Jesus. And we receive these miracles tonight. We receive these things tonight. And Father, we thank you for it. For a complete list of Andrew Womack's teaching tapes, you can write to Andrew Womack Ministries, P.O. Box 3333, Colorado Springs, Colorado, 80934.